All right, listeners, I think you know that we are part of the Radiotopia Network, which is basically a network built on the idea that you should support the most creative, independent audio makers around. No one, and I mean no one, embodies the Radiotopia ethos more than Benjamin Walker and his show, Theory of Everything. Benjamin, who I've known for a long time, has been making beautiful, personal, sprawling audio documentaries for decades that help us understand the very strange world we live in. And now he has a new series called Not All Propaganda is Art. The new series goes back to the 1950s, when Western security agencies like the CIA paid artists, writers, and intellectuals to fight the cultural Cold War. The CIA funds were free. I mean, no one was told what to say. Gloria Steinem, activist who sees the CIA as a sort of enlightened pal or rich uncle, there is another viewpoint. Look, if you're listening to this show, I know you like secret histories. I know you like a mix of culture and politics and shadowy figures. So what are you waiting for? Not all propaganda is art from Benjamin Walker. You can find it now wherever you listen or at theoryofeverythingpodcast.com. This day is brought to you by Progressive. Are you driving your car or doing laundry right now? Podcasts go best when they're bundled with another activity. Kind of like progressive home and auto policies. They're best when bundled too. Having those two policies together makes insurance easier and could help you save. Customers who save by switching their home and car insurance to progressive save nearly $800 on average. Quote a home and car bundle today at progressive.com. Progressive Casualty Insurance Company and Affiliates. National average 12-month savings of $793 by new customers surveyed who saved with Progressive between June 2021 and May 2022. Potential savings will vary. Hello and welcome to This Day in Esoteric Political History from Radiotopia. My name is Jody Avergan. And welcome to 2022. This is our episode for January 4th. Before I tell you what the date is and the, what the hook is, uh, I guess we should talk about where we're recording this episode. We are all back in our silos, back at our homes, recording from home, which is not what we intended for this episode. <laughs> <laughs> we had an excellent plan. It involved had big dreams. <laughs> big dreams Three of us being all together in the same space. Up in Boston. And spoiler alert, we actually did that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Kelly and Jody met in person for the very first time. Sure it was did. beautiful. That was wonderful. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I was like, wow, you're taller in person. <laughs> well, I'm always sitting on the Zooms. Um, but, you know, uh, look, we went up to Boston right before the world went back into craziness um, with COVID stuff. And we did have a, a bunch of meetings about the show with the Radiotopia folks. And we did record um, a couple special episodes that we were intending to run this week. As happens from time to time, the uh, you know audio processing gremlins got a hold of that audio and it was... Um, it's unusable, unfortunately. So our, you know, only ever in-person taping has been lost to time. And um, I, we will do it again. 2022, we will do in-person tapings. We will do hopefully live events. I really believe that this year is going to be very different from last year. So I'm choosing to think of this um, this little glitch as 2021's last FU as opposed to any sort of sign for what's coming in 2022. No, we're going to be this- optimistic. Yeah. <laughs> This year, we are not going to feed the radio mogwai after midnight. Yes. <laughs> That's going to be the new resolution. <laughs> there you go. Um, so um, those voices, of course, are Nicole Hammer of Columbia and Kelly Carter Jackson of Wellesley. And hello there and welcome to 2022. <laughs> hello and happy new year, Jody. I know. Hey there. <laughs> um, I suppose we could keep the chaotic energy going with our mm. today's uh, episode. And so, you know, this is January 4th. We're talking about 1999. And the story that we're going to discuss is Jesse the Body Ventura being sworn in as Minnesota's 38th governor. Um you know, Ventura had floated this idea that during his inauguration, he would repel down the walls of the state capitol rotunda, which um, may have been a good fit. You know, he's a former wrestler. He ends up having a fairly normal ceremony and I would say maybe a fairly normal political career, given, you know, that he was a former WWE star running for governor and, and elected as governor. So let's do that. I already introed everyone. So let's get into it. Um, why not start 2022 where we start 
with what much of what we did in 2021, which is say, you know, talk about how everything is a media story, paint the sort of like way Jesse Ventura was able to capture an attention economy in the late 90s and really ride that all the way towards towards getting elected as a third party candidate. So as you mentioned, Jesse Ventura was a WWE star. This was a huge thing in the 1990s. It was this kind of sports entertainment Mm -hmm. that had just captured uh, the public imagination. It was in the 1980s, the 1990s, pro wrestling. There were lots of debates over, is it real, is it fake? But it was driven by these huge personalities. And Jesse Ventura was one of those. So most people who knew Ventura knew him as this this character. Um, he was somebody who had served in the Navy. He had served on in the Navy SEALs, um, the elite squad in, uh, in the Navy. And then he had transformed that into this kind of entertainment career and then leveraged that into politics. And when he announces that he is going to run for governor of Minnesota, I mean, people don't take him seriously, right? And why would they? Here was this mm-hmm. guy who was in this... You know, from the outside, kind of goofy, um, maybe not entirely real sport. And the idea that he was now running for governor, I think, at least for many political observers, they found laughable. And and he's running against seasoned opponents. I mean, Hubert Humphrey III, the son of Lyndon B. Johnson's uh, vice president and the attorney general of Minnesota. He's also running against St. Paul Mayor Norm Coleman. And these are, you know, formidable candidates who are spending millions of dollars on their campaign, about $4.3 million on their campaign. And Ventura, who's running as this Reform Party candidate, he only spends $250,000. And that money he raised by selling (laughs) T-shirts... And accepting fifty dollar donations, so this is really like a, like a mom and pop organization that he's pulling together in order to win this campaign. Twenty two dollar t shirts, which is too much for a t shirt, even if it's for a campaign, <laughs> especially in in the late nineties. You know, account for inflation, but twenty two bucks is pushing it a little bit. I know not t shirts; sometimes they run up into the thirties or whatever. But that's it's a little audacious. But nevertheless, yeah, I raised a, a good amount of money. But yeah, that well, he didn't. But he didn't raise that much money. Well, that's right? true. He raised no. two hundred fifty thousand yeah. yeah, dollars, which true. compared to everyone else right it's pretty slim pickings. and he got what you know we've we've talked about this on the show and how i think it's a misnomer but this sort of earned media right of just free free media because he's got you know there's cable news there's a whole economy of news and he is there to help fill that attention gap um i want to linger a little on the wrestling thing just because i do feel like there's probably some big tidy theory about how like the wrestling ethos explains modern American politics and just the idea of like say something to get attention it doesn't matter Mm -hmm. there's that whole notion of is is kayfabe is that how it's pronounced but k-a-y-f-a-b-e you know but basically that's what wrestling is built around just sort of like it doesn't matter if it's true or if it's not you just perform true acts Mm -hmm. um, you know the blend of sort of reality and, and scripted stuff and obviously Donald Trump picked up a lot of this he has also done some stuff with wrestling and so forth but i mean this idea of just like performing um Mm -hmm. you know i think politics has become more like wrestling in every way uh over the last years and dazzle exactly and you know (laughs) and like and honestly you know masculinity and just kind of like i think centering that in many ways is a huge part of it and going back to this inaugural ceremony right um when you read accounts of it it does strike me as like a very testosterone filled room. Oh right? Arnold gosh, Schwarzenegger yeah. is there, uh, you know, <laughs> all these like alpha males are there. And then the kinds of people and the kinds of voters who were attracted to Jesse Ventura, no surprise, but it's a lot of like young white males. And, you know, you yeah. do see some of those parallels to, I think, Trump, where he just sort of unlocked a sort of mm-hmm. well of, of masculinity in this country and made white men feel good and feel energized i mean he's posing in one of his campaign ads in like like uh athletic shorts or little like um gym shorts basically and you know showing off his physique and 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 body and there it's not just masculinity there's sex appeal to that Mm -hmm. too you know it's a way of trying to say i'm a man's man and your wives want me and give me your vote and but that kind of you know celebrity athletic appeal is certainly a part of the package 
And I think something that we think of as more modern than 1998, right? You think about somebody like Dan Bongino, who came out of the military and the Secret Service. And in recent years, that emphasis on both military, but also like mixed martial arts and that kind of Mm -hmm. ethos has been really important to a certain kind of masculinity, especially on the right. And you see that in Ventura, not just in the WWE, but in his his relationship to the SEALs. I think that that military background is a big part of it, too. Well, I mean, Mm -hmm. you know, you you can fill out your modern Republican Party bingo card just by Jesse Ventura. It's like radio host, check. WWE, check. Former Navy SEAL, check. You know, third party, check. I mean, it's just remarkable how much so much of the template is there in in that. That said, as I was going into this, I was like, oh, I'm going to see all sorts of Trump parallels. There's going to be lots of, you know, the blueprint here for for Trumpism. That was my instinct starting to, to research this story and look into it. And, you know, I feel like I'd noticed more differences maybe subtle differences than than similarities and i'm curious you know kind of where maybe we can paint a picture of of how jesse ventura was actually different from he wasn't just trump before trump and trump in minnesota or maybe you think i'm wrong no i think that you're right you know one of the things that is different is that he takes it very seriously because remember Mm -hmm. he actually is a wwe star i don't know if you remember in 2016 at the republican national convention trump tries to uh, copy some of that WWE, uh, the the visuals, right? He comes mm-hmm. out on stage to a black stage and the slow rise of the, the door opening up and the fog and the lights spilling out while he's in silhouette. He's trying to bring that WWE magic to the stage. Whereas for Jesse Ventura, he wanted to be taken seriously. Yeah. He actually thought he had good ideas about government and wanted to govern and he had um, served so as a mayor we really should have said that you know right yeah, off the bat, but yeah. he was just coming off a of mayorality too but I, I think that when the problem and to to give him some credit he did say that part of the scrutiny that he got was all about sort of his pomp and circumstance and not really about his policy that he did have policies about not just being sort of tough on crime but actually looking at like drug addiction as a public health issue and not so much um, attached to criminality he wanted to like decrease class sizes in Minnesota and get more funding to to schools um, he did have some ideas that I think changed the way that Minnesotans live their lives in a, in a very progressive way yeah and he was operating just in a very different context. I mean, the 1990s in Minnesota is different from the 20-teens on the national stage. I mean, part of that is that Minnesota itself is a more heterogeneous state when it comes to political parties. So they have more of an appetite for third-party politics in Minnesota. And in the 1990s, you know, he's running on the Reform Party ticket, which is actually Ross Perot's party. Um, So he's operating in this moment when Americans have uh, demonstrated an appetite and a willingness to vote for unconventional candidates. Mm -hmm. Um, And I think that that is a big part of the story, too. Yeah, some of those structural things in Minnesota itself. There's also same-day voter registration, Mm -hmm. um, which I think he credits and a lot of people credit for just letting a lot of people who were just newly energized by him show up at the polls and help him. I mean, he was not doing great for much of the race, you know, he's polling at 10% just a couple of months before the election. And so he sort of rockets out of nowhere. And I think that's propelled a lot by voters coming off the sidelines. Interesting to think about now as we talk about voter reform and same day registration. And, you know, I think it opens the door for candidates like this, for sure. Um, Absolutely. And we'll see. Yeah, same day voter registration. I mean, it's, it's a game changer, especially when you think about the people who attended his inauguration and all of the celebrations that come when he gets sworn into office. A lot of these people have voted for the first time, yeah. and, and this is their candidate. Yeah. Um, the Reform Party is interesting because, I mean, Nikki, you, you know, you've talked so much about this, but that is the one that is the party that Pat Buchanan ends up picking up. And Ventura sort of famously or yep. not famously, famously now because we're talking about it on this hit podcast. Uh, but, but Ventura, you know, breaks with with the party probably because of Buchanan. And then he also is very, very much against Donald Trump. You know, they had some ties back in the early 2000s. But as Trump begins his political career in 2014, 2015, Ventura comes out pretty strongly against him. So he he tries to draw a line even within that sort of reform party world. 
Yeah, Pat Buchanan winning the Reform Party nomination in 2000 leads to two splits. It leads Ventura to leave the party and it leaves Trump to leave the party as well, because Trump at the time was um, eyeballing the nomination. And the two men go in very different directions right. after yeah. that. But it, that was a, a pretty signal moment for the future of the Reform Party. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, a couple of the little tidbits, and then I want to talk about how he kind of... Um, Peters out as a governor, but you know, in terms of what he does, I mean, one notable thing is, yes, I think like a lot of people look back and say, here was a governor who actually took um, mental health and drug addiction and the combination of the two very seriously, and he cared about that. Um, he also, maybe no surprise, you know, tried to roll back taxes, and he re- uh, did a sales tax rebate, and he sent Minnesotans Jesse checks in the late summer of his first year, um, and that, you know, I think. We recall that Donald Trump was very interested in putting his name on the pandemic uh, relief checks. Mm -hmm. And, you know, Mm -hmm. I think that comes a lot from that sort of sales salesman uh, ethos for sure. Um, No surprise. He picked fights with the press a lot. I think that probably has a lot to do with the sort of wrestling ethos of just like the press (laughs) is a great foil, right? It's a great place to sort of do the kayfabe and... um, he also had this very raucous inauguration party. And Kelly, since you're our yeah. 19th century person, I wonder what you're thinking about this. All I could think was like Andrew Jackson, who presented himself as man of the people, opening up the White House, yeah. all of the hoi polloi. And he has that same kind of inaugural ball. Oh, my gosh. It's like, <laughs> I think it's funny because there's no like sort of attire that would be considered inappropriate. It's like, if you want to wear a tux, sure, wear it. You want to wear chaps and leather? Sure, <laughs> wear it. Like, he's wearing like a, a Jimi Hendrix t shirt and a bright yellow boa. I mean, like, it doesn't sort of get more outlandish than that, but I think it just it signals to the kind of charismatic personality that he had it brings in a lot of the wrestling past as well these very flamboyant you know outfits and things of that nature but um yeah, yeah. it's definitely Though, different maybe maybe i'm i'm doing way too much reading into this but at the inauguration itself he just wears a i went and looked at photos you know he just wears like a yeah. very regular conventional suit and i do think there is something there about like you talk this big game you push the line you sort of move the window of what's acceptable but then when push comes to shove you kind of do the conventional thing. And I think we yeah. see that time and time again with the, some of these politicians who really kind of try and play that double game, right, of, mm-hmm. of both wanting to be part of the elite, but then also wanting to sort of talk the talk of being, being out there and being outrageous. Yeah, you don't repel down the wall. And you no. see that too with, uh, you know, five years later with uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger when he becomes yeah. governor of California. Yeah, he definitely true. buttons it up. For yeah. sure. And I mean, there's a time and a place. I think there's, you know, the campaign trail is one thing, but mm-hmm. when you're in office, you know, you really do have to step up to the plate. All um, all those jokes and, and tricks have to be really put to the side. Yeah. If you're going to be taken seriously and get anything done, especially if you want to run again. Right. Right. So let's let's wrap up and talk a little bit about how his one term comes to an end. I mean, tell me if this is being ungenerous, but it seems to me like he just kind of doesn't get as many wins as he'd like, and he starts to maybe check out a little bit halfway through his first term. I think that's pretty accurate. He, (laughs) he, um, you know, it's fun at first when you have that rush of this new power, see what you can get done. Mm -hmm. You're getting all those wins, and then you get into the hard nitty gritty of governing, and you're basically just an administrator. And Mm. that is not very fun at all. No, no. no. I think he actually enjoyed more... um, speaking on late night TV shows and doing book tours or writing his next book. Um, I think that gave him more energy than actually like governing. Yeah. Yeah. And he also entered this sort of like, well, what I think we can recognize as sort of, grievance cycle where you know he feels he's not being taken seriously so he lashes out at the press well then the press then doesn't take him seriously because it seems like all he's doing is picking fights and then he feels like oh well no one's actually looking at my accomplishments and it just becomes this sort of cycle of of playing that media game um and then he yeah he decides not to run in 2002 and goes back in many ways to just sort of what his career path probably would have been right a lot of talk radio a lot of late night appearances showing up on wwe still from time to time also dipping his nose into politics from time to time. He stumped for John Kerry in 2004. Um, Obviously, as we discussed, you know, broke with Trump. He's still floating around, right? Yeah, Yeah, he's he's still still alive. (laughs) He's still around. (laughs) 
<laughs> he's still around. Maybe not the same sort of voice that he was, you know, of the 1990s and 2000s. But um, he, I mean, I still put him in the same pocket that I put Arnold Schwarzenegger or yeah. some of these other celebrities turned politicians. Um, they still sort of maybe not have an incredible impact on the moment, but you still think of them in terms of context. You know, when you look at where he is right now, you could imagine many different paths for someone like Jesse Ventura and his politics. And, I, you know, to put it bluntly, he could have probably gone full Alex Jones and he probably could have gone full, you know, Marion Williamson or and, you know, it does seem like he is mostly these days when he's you know he does youtube shows and he does radio hits and so forth he talks a lot about like drone strikes he talks a lot about Ju julian assange and then you know but he talks about repealing the filibuster I'm, I'm curious you know kind of what space you see him occupying um in our very weird and <laughs> fractured political taxonomy of the moment you know, he's still a political outsider. He's somebody who was part of the Reform Party. He toys around with the idea of maybe becoming part of the Green Party. And from that position, he is able to criticize some of the things that are embraced by elites in both parties. Um, so they not, you know, opposing the drone strikes, opposing the prosecution of Julian Assange. You know, he's not quite a libertarian, but he is skeptical of state power. And I think that fits in very neatly with his um, sort of outside populist third party career yeah all right well that brings us to the end of the episode i think a great place to start we've been wanting to do jesse ventura for a long time <laughs> listeners have been um uh asking us to do it and i think as i said at the beginning of the show you know it's a nice chaotic energy to start well it feels like <laughs> a, a continuation of a chaotic energy type of but this space that we've created here on this show is wonderful and calming and nourishing <laughs> so i appreciate it <laughs> um nicole hammer thanks to you Thank you, Jody. And Kelly Carter-Jackson, thanks to you. My pleasure. This Day in Esoteric Political History is a proud member of Radiotopia from PRX, a network of independent, listener-supported, artist-owned podcasts. Our researcher and producer is Jacob Feldman. Our producer is Brittany Brown. Kala Nakua helps with transcripts. Julie Shapiro is executive producer for Radiotopia. Get in touch with us if you have any questions or comments or ideas for the show. You can email us, thisdaypod at gmail.com, or you can find a form at thisdaypod.com, where you can also get our full archives, transcripts, and learn lots more about the show. Follow us on social at This Day Pod on Instagram and Twitter, where we are posting stuff each and every day. My name is Jody Avergan. Thanks again for listening, and we'll see you soon. Support for this day in esoteric political history comes from Odoo. What is Odoo? Well, Odoo is an all-in-one management software with apps for every business need. Odoo has apps for CRM, accounting, sales, HR, inventory, manufacturing, and everything in between. And they're all in one easy-to-use software. And the best part about Odoo? All Odoo apps are integrated, helping you get things done faster and more efficiently. So when you think about business, think Odoo. To learn more, visit odoo.com slash this day. That's O-D-O-O -O dot com slash this day. Radiotopia.